good morning, everyone. How's it going? Who got up an hour earlier today? Good. Yeah, my clock didn't change when the time changed. But, hey, my name is Jerry Parmentier, here, and I have the pleasure of serving as your children's minister here at Harmony Hill. I want to take an opportunity to say welcome. We're glad that you're here. We're thankful for each one of you and your uh, partnership in the ministry of Jesus Christ here at the church. If you're uh, watching with us online, we want to say welcome to you as well. Today, I have an honor to welcome our guests, and uh, each week, we pray that God would send guests our way, and if you're here, you are an answer to prayer. One of the ways that we connect with our guests, if you'll look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there is a connect card or a next steps card, and that gives you an opportunity to tell us a little bit of information about yourself. And then you have two options, the way to turn that in. If you'll turn it in, you can either turn it in at the offering bag or there is a next steps table at the back. And we would love for to stop by. We have a special gift that we have chosen just for you and would love to share that with you as well. Today, uh, one of the things that we do here at Harmony Hill, and I'm very thankful for, is God continues to grow our church membership and God continues to bless our families with birth. And today is an opportunity that we get to celebrate new life. We get to celebrate the life that God gives. And we call that parent dedication. And what parent dedication is, is it's all about commitments. It's commitments in the parents' relationship. So mom and dad's commitment to daily have a personal walk with the Lord, also to have a daily commitment, keep their commitments to each other, as well as to be their child's primary faith influencer. Because it scripturally says, as parents, it's our responsibility to train up and grow our children in the admonition of the Lord. And as we do that, what we're doing is we're planting seeds of truth into their life. And at the earliest possible age, when that child starts asking questions about who Jesus is, we desire that parents be the one that start that conversation, that, that continues to enter that conversation and watch each child go from death to life in Christ. And we firmly believe that it starts at home and it starts with moms and dads. So today I'm excited to tell you we have one family in this service and we have three in the next that we get to celebrate those commitments. So what I'd like to do is invite the Pope family up on the stage. And the Pope, it's Joe, excuse me, it's uh, Joseph and Karen Pope. And they are bringing... Uh, Joseph Stainer, Eric Pope Jr., and Maggie Lude Hope to the stage. And during our uh, parent dedication class, one of the, the things that we ask our parents, we say, parents, is there a specific Bible verse that you are praying over your children? Do you have a verse that over the life of their life that they, you pray that they live out. And so the, the Pope family has chosen, and I'm going to read it out loud to you. It's Psalm 127, 3 through 5. And the verse reads, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. And that's found in Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Our prayer is that is a verse that's lived out in your family and lived out in your children as you continue to raise them up in a godly home. As I said, this is a time of commitment. This is a time of commitment for you guys. And I'm, I'm going to ask some affirmations. And if you guys would just say we do at the end of those affirmations. I have three for the parents and I have two for our church family. And when we get to those two, we're going to say amen after each one, okay? Can we practice all right, church, do we affirm that commitment? Yeah. All right, good. We're, we're awake. This is good. That extra hour got you guys wide awake. This is good. So parents, he's good, <laughs> I promise. Joe, Karen, do you guys commit to grow in your relationship with the Lord on a daily basis? Do you commit to be committed to each other in a growing relationship with each other? And do you commit to raise your children in a godly home to be their primary faith influencer so that when they start asking about Jesus, you guys will be the ones that continue to share that information with them? Amen. Thank you. Church family, do we affirm or commit to be a church that continues to stand on the word of God? Amen. 
And do we as a church continue or affirm that we will be a church that's welcoming, loving, and praying for the families that are raising up the next generation that will continue to live and make the church continue to go forth? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I firmly believe children are a gift from you. Father, I firmly am thankful that you give us the opportunity to invest in life. Father, you give us moms and dads and each of us roles and responsibilities. I pray that you would put your hand upon this family. I pray that you would grow them in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And Father, that they would come to know who you are at the earliest possible age. Father, for our church here, Harmony Hill Baptist Church, I pray that we would be a church that continues to stand firm on the word of God. I pray that we would continue to be a church family that loves and welcomes people. Father, thank you so much for the love of Jesus that we have, and we have the opportunity to share with those around us. May we never get tired of sharing that story. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we have a lot of exciting things going on right here on the Hill. I would like for you each to turn to the screen, and let's watch what's going on. Hey, church. Movie Night returns to Harmony Hill. Bring your lawn chairs and your movie snacks to enjoy a family-friendly movie together in the main parking lot with the kids' ministry. The show starts at 6 p.m. on our large outdoor video screen. Don't miss it. We believe Christ is the catalyst, and apart from Him, we can do nothing. Join us for a time of intentional prayer as our deacons lead us on Monday, November the 13th at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center. The focus of our prayer will be centered around the value together in the faith as we ask the Lord's guidance over our church family. What is church membership? Why does it matter? And how do you join? If you want answers to these questions and are ready to take the next step in joining our faith family, plan to attend our membership class on Sunday, November the 19th at 10 a.m. at the Harmony House. Registration is available online via the website or church app. Church staff and elders are looking forward to meeting and walking alongside you as we share how we do life together in the faith. On Sunday, November the 19th, we will have a special service to ordain Jerry Parmentier and Jeff Little. Please make plans to join us for this special time of worship and prayer. Make sure to stay up to date with everything happening on the Hill. Check out your weekly bulletin, our church app, or visit our website for the latest updates and events. Now let's join together in worship. It is good to have all of you in worship with us today. So glad that you have joined us. Psalm 18 tells us that I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Do you believe that this morning? He is worthy of our praise. Let's stand together as we sing, I will call upon the Lord. Call and response. I'll sing first. I will call upon Yeah. 
So if you've got breath this morning, let everything that has breath sing. Let everything that, everything that, everything he himself suffered. He is one who helps us when we're being tempted. I must tell Jesus. Martha, sing it for us. Jesus, all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens of I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me. Jesus. Tell 
that my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the victory. He will win. I must tell Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could ever do. No one ever can. take a little bit of time right now. Todd is going to be preaching on prayer. Come on, we sing, I must tell Jesus all of my sorrows, all of my troubles, all my cares, my woes. I must tell Jesus all my praise to him as well and my thanksgiving. 
and all that he gives to me. And so I want us to take a moment, church, to just to pray together to the Lord. And right now there may be burdens on your heart that are, that are very heavy. There may be a family member whom you need to pray for for salvation or for healing, healing for yourself. Maybe a neighbor that you need to share Jesus with and you know it and you haven't done that yet. Maybe just another opportunity for God to use you in your workplace. So let's take a minute just to ask the Lord to intervene and also to pray for Todd as he brings the word in just a moment to us. Remember, nobody cares for you like Jesus cares for you. You can be seated right now and then and just take a moment to pray. And then I'll close this in just, just a moment. The altar is open. If you'd like to come here to pray, you're welcome to do that. Fathers, we come to you in prayer right now. Lord, sometimes we don't do near enough of that. It's conversation with you, speaking to our Creator who hears us individually. You hear me, God, thank you. You hear us as families. You hear us as, as life groups. You hear us as a church. God, you hear us as believers all over the world as we pray to you, asking you to, to just guide us, to give us wisdom, to give us strength. Lord, to give us all that we need, because you are all we need. Lord, I just ask that today, as Todd brings the word in just a moment, that God, you will, you will carry us and help us to understand what it is you're speaking from your word this very day. Give Todd's a word, Todd the words to speak. Lord, our hearts to be melted and molded to you, for our minds to be engaged in what you're trying to tell us. So that when we leave here today, we can go and take on a world that is lost, that is dying, and doesn't know the peace that we know that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord, this be a beacon of light. Harmony, it will be a beacon of light in our community, in our country and around the world. Literally, those we have people who are, are uh, under the influence of Harmony Hill Baptist Church, Lord. And, and we just ask that you just guide all of that. May your word go out strong today and in the days and years to come as we strive to seek you, seek your face, seek your way, seek your will. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for this. Thank you, Lord, for carrying us and for caring for us. And it's in your name that I pray. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen.
no problem to be. God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall. He cannot move it. And there is no storm cloud too dark. God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow too Good morning. So good to be with you today. And uh, as we get started, I just want to uh, publicly commend Pastor Ross for an incredible uh, month uh, dedicated to missions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was so good. Uh, I, I personally got so much out of it. And uh, you may not think of it, but it is good. Uh, Pastor John can relate to this. But it is good for the preacher sometimes to be able to be fed from the pulpit as well. And I Thoroughly enjoyed that focus, but I am delighted to be back this morning as we are focusing on prayer. We're going to be looking over the next few weeks in Matthew 6 in and around the passage that we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And so let me go ahead and read Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 1 and then I'm going to jump and read verses 5 through 8. And so follow along with me, starting in verse 1 and then 5 through 8. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So we're going to be looking at this. And in your notes, I've got this written down, and I'll probably review it every week. But the reason for this series, the reason I felt led to lead a series on prayer is for this. To instill confidence or to stir up a renewed passion for personal prayer. We all know what it's like to try something out that we're not confident yet in. We are worried about doing or saying the wrong thing. And for maybe some in this room and and maybe watching online, prayer is one of those things that you don't have a lot of confidence in and you are worried about, am I doing it right? Am I saying the right things? And so I want to just bring some confidence as we look at this over the next four weeks. How do we pray? And then for others of us, maybe prayer is not a lack of confidence, but it has fallen into such a rhythmic routine that it is no longer meaningful. And so I pray that this month we can stir up a renewed passion for prayer. I'm reminded of this idea of being fearful of doing or saying the wrong thing when when I was in high school, I was uh, dating this young lady, and we had not been dating very long, but long enough that I was invited to her dad's remarriage. And this was his fourth remarriage. And so we were going to have, uh, there's a little ceremony he had met and fell in love at Cracker Barrel with his server. And so we were getting ready to, to have this. And I remember she, you know, the girl I was dating was going to be in the small ceremony. And so I'm just there. And somehow I end up in the room with her dad who I'd only met on one other occasion. And it's just moments before the ceremony. I have no role. I'm just supposed to be there, but I'm sort of in the room as he's getting ready. And as a junior in high school, I don't have a lot of confidence and experience in talking to adult men that I don't know, and especially the father of someone that I'm dating. And I am scrambling, trying to figure out how do I make small talk. And he's sort of getting ready. He's got his tux on. And I notice that he is wearing a cummerbund. And I had just gone through the process of renting a tux for prom, and I knew that you can choose between cummerbund or vest. And so I'm going, okay, I'm just the awkwardness of the silence is killing me. And so I just say, I see you went with the cummerbund. And he sort of looks at it and he's like, yeah. And I'm dying now. I'm like, oh, this is going nowhere. I thought this was going to be it. And so then I jump back in and say, well, I guess as many times as you've done this, you know what you like. (laughs) That... That is the fear of saying the wrong thing. It's also probably the first time in my life that I prayed for the Lord's imminent return (laughs) to happen immediately. See, when it comes to prayer, though, we have these moments where we are worried about, are we going to say the right thing? Am I going to do the right thing? And so over the course of this series... I pray that God will use this to encourage and stoke a passion for personal prayer, communication with our God. And so in this passage that we've read, we see that today what I want to focus on, what Jesus is focusing on, before we get to the content of how to pray, we must first look at the heart motivations behind our prayers. And so Jesus gives us two diagnostics for checking our motivation in prayer. So in this passage, you'll notice in verse 1, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is basically shifting to a new section of teaching in this sermon. And what he's basically saying to those in attendance is, if you're serious about following God, if you're serious about personal righteousness, if you're serious about genuine acts of, of piety, then let me give you some instruction. And he's actually giving three instructions. I'm only 
choosing to talk about the middle one today, but he's going to talk about the motivation and the piety behind giving, about generosity and the heart behind that, about prayer and about fasting. And so verse 1 is sort of an umbrella verse for all three of those topics, which he says, don't be a hypocrite seeking to gain approval for your deeds of righteousness from others. And then when you jump into the specific talk about prayer in verse 5, he says again, don't be a hypocrite. These hypocrites stand up in public places trying to draw attention to themselves for their prayers. And Jesus says they have received their reward for that prayer. Every answer and benefit that could happen for that prayer was received the moment they did it for other people's viewing. Instead, go into the inner room in secret and your father who sees and meets with you in that secret place will then give you your reward so two motivational diagnostics number one we must check our heart motivation we must check our heart motivation In this, and um, let me just go ahead and give you this, the question to ask ourselves as part of this diagnostic, as we're praying, as we're thinking about praying today, the first question to ask ourselves is when we pray, whose name is being glorified in my prayers? Whose name is being glorified in my prayers? Using the example Jesus is giving, this is someone who is looking for other eyeballs, to glorify them for their prayer. It would be as if these gentlemen, there would be regular regimented times during the day that you would pray. And it's almost as if these guys would time their schedule for the times of prayer to be just when they got to a very populated corner of the street. So that, oh, it's time for prayer And then they stand and begin praying. And the idea is, look at me how righteous I am. Whose name is being glorified in that prayer? It's certainly not Yahweh. It's them. It's us. Now, we don't have, at least in my observation. I don't see a lot of people going into Walmart or into Brookshire's or other public spaces and standing up looking for a crowd and then just praying out loud, hoping for people to go, man, that is a righteous person. That, that's not happening in our context. But what we do see happening in our context is this ever-growing reality of look at me. I think about it, some of you know this, I love sports, and I was just thinking about even in, in football, in college football, the, the, the evolution of the look at me nature of football. If you go back years and years ago, there were not names of individuals on jerseys. It was only the name on the front of the jersey. Then at some point, we began putting names on the backs of the jerseys, which became more identifying And now we live in an age, and I'm not even saying I'm against it necessarily, but now we live in the age of the NIL name, image, and likeness, which even elevates even more, look at me and my accomplishments, to where the name on the front of the jersey is only as good as the paycheck that can be given to the name on the back of the jersey. Look at me. We live in a world of social media in which everything we do is designed for a look at me. So many people, and it's not just limited to young people, so many people derive their identity by how many followers or likes or shares they get on social media posts and platforms. Look at me. And can I tell you that 
We are not immune in the church of look at me status. We actually have in American culture, and and somewhat you could say even worldwide, in the church a, I can't even imagine this is a real thing, but it is very real that we now have celebrity pastors. (laughs) I mean, there's one, on one hand, God is using some guys, and then on others, people have engineered a look at me status. But even if there wasn't celebrity pastors, even some people who are well-meaning need to be reminded of verses like this. Because when we go out and we pray, we do good deeds, we are quick to post on social media. Look at what we did. Look how I gave. I can even imagine Jesus says, go into an inner room, a whole blogosphere of Hey, come on into my inner prayer closet. Let me show you how I've set it up. And what Jesus is saying is when our motivation for righteousness, whether it be prayer or anything else, is for the approval of others, our reward is as completed as the last like on that social media post. There is no eternal reward when our motivation is about glorifying our own name. Now, when it comes to prayer, when we think about our prayers, I was reading this week that the average American Christian, not just average American, but people who profess Christ, spend on average seven minutes in prayer a week. And the content of those prayers is typically around three main topics, meals, personal plans, and request for personal blessing. Now that's not necessarily, we're not, that's not necessarily wrong to pray for a meal or to ask God to bless our plans or to ask for, you know, something. But if that's the total content and it is reduced to seven minutes, Are we really tapping into the freedom, as Hebrews reminds us, even the boldness that we as believers have to enter into the very presence of God for prayer? What is our motivation? Well, just from that statistic alone, it's still glorifying me. God bless my meal, bless my plans, and then whatever other personal blessing. As we learn how to pray, may we be reminded of the motivation for prayer. And so for Jesus, the, the opposite of doing things where others may see us is to then go into a private space, into an inner room. Meaning, essentially, it's not about the place. It's still about the motivation. It's to go where no one will see you praying and pray. Because when no one can see us praying, now we are forced to confront why are we actually praying. And for many of us, if we're being honest, there will be great temptation. In fact, at the end of this, I'm going to challenge every one of us at least one time this week to go to a place where no one else can see us and pray. And for many, the temptation will be to leave that room and let someone know we just prayed. (laughs) The temptation will be to go and say something like, I- I'm sorry I can't have lunch with you. I'm, I'm going to be praying uh, privately this week. <laughs> the the temptation is going to be uh, to try to work into a conversation later in the week. You know, as I was praying in my inner room this week, God revealed to me. And again, the question comes back to the motivation for why do we pray? The second question as we diagnose and this idea of what is our heart motivation is whose reward do I seek? Whose reward do I seek? In this passage, Jesus is making very clear that there are two types of reward. There is the reward we get from man and there's a reward we get from God. 
Are we seeking even in our prayer life the approval of others or the approval of God? Or connection and relationship with God? This idea of reward, it is so amazing to me that Jesus just clearly lays it out. If we pray in such a way for others to acknowledge us, that, be, that ends the reward. So then it begs the question, what is the reward when we pray in secret and our Father who sees us in secret will grant us a reward? And I was thinking about that, and there was an author, um, I'm going to butcher his name, Gutzweiler, who I think answers the question. He says, the reward for the believer in prayer, for genuine heart, pure motivation of prayer, the reward is God himself. It's not that there are even answers to our prayer list. It is that we have been with God. And that is enough of a reward for us to go. I want more than just light applause. I want God. That is our motivation. And I tell you, if you go this week into an inner room or into a place where you can pray this week, and your entire motivation is, God, I just want you. You're doing it right. You're doing it right if all you want is to be with him. What is the reward that we really are after? Now, before we move on from this diagnostic, I just want to say this. God is not, or Jesus in this passage, is not saying that we should never pray out loud or in public. He's specifically speaking of our heart motivation because Jesus himself prayed out loud and in public. We see examples across scriptures of people praying out loud and in public. But what he's saying is this. When we have a personal prayer life apart from the applause of other men and women, then when we pray in, with others, with the corporate body, then it's just out of an overflow of our relationship with him. Can I tell you that, I mean, just full transparency, there are times when I pray even at church out loud that I received my full reward at the moment that I said amen because I was trying to re-preach the sermon in the prayer instead of connecting to God or I'm trying to remember some, all of a sudden it hits me something I forgot to say that I meant to say, and now I'm going to try to teach it to you in the prayer instead of going, I'm not talking to you in prayer. I'm on behalf of those who are gathered praying to him, our reward. Him who matters, him who is everything, him who is worthy in my public prayer is not an opportunity to give you the cliff notes to a sermon that I just preached. It's to say, on behalf of this body, God, you are good. We all struggle with motivation, don't we? There are times I remember, uh, particularly when I was in high school, uh, this isn't necessarily prayer, but when it was worship time, and if I was near a pretty girl, um, my musical singing was no longer for the Lord, it was maybe she'll hear this and be like, man, I really ought to go out with that guy. I had a lot of things to learn, right? But my prayer, my song ended at the roof because the motivation was not pure. And what I want for you, what I want for me, is that we pray and that our reward is that we have communed with God. The second diagnostic is this, not only our heart motivation, but we need to check our theological motivation. We have to check our theological motivation. Here is good news also in your notes. You do not have to impress or coerce God with your words. 
You do not have to impress or coerce God with your words. See, in verses 7 and 8, Jesus not moves away from the religious of uh, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, and now he moves to the pagan Gentiles as an example. And he says, don't mimic the Pharisees, they're hypocrites, and don't mimic the Gentiles because they think that by piling up their words on top of each other, they can twist God's arm, essentially, into answering their prayers. There was this belief that the longer the prayer, the more likely you would get the attention of the deity. Or if you could be so persuasive that you could convince the deity to answer your prayers. And if I had to be honest, the number one reason that I hear from people why they are not confident in prayer is because they are worried that they're not going to say it eloquently enough or the words are not going to be correct. And can I just tell you in this room, whether you have a, I'm just looking over here, Kate. What, what, what grade is Kate in? First grade. So whether you're in first grade, you have a first grade education or a doctorate in this room, you, whatever your vocabulary is, is the heart song God wants you to pray. And everywhere in between. We talk about, you know, there's $15 words, and if that's like part of your normal vocabulary, then yeah, I pray to God that way. But if, if you're using nickel words, not four letter necessarily, but nickel words, then just use that. God is not standing there going, I would have answered if they could have just used a thesaurus. <laughs> oh, they were that close. But sometimes... That sounds silly and we're laughing, but sometimes personally, that's what's going through our mind. It is the simplistic heart prayer. Understand our theology. We do not need to convince God or coerce him or impress him. Don't stack up words just to stack up words. Or Babel is actually the translation there, just trying to get his attention. But here is then the question that many of you maybe asked before as we move, move to this next question to ask yourself, why then do I need to pray if God already knows my need? So notice in this passage in verse 8, Jesus in verse 7 has said, don't just put words on end trying to come up with the right combination. It's not a magic formula. He goes, because God already knows what you need anyways. And that's what he's saying. Don't, you don't have to try to be like, God, I know you're not aware, but I've got this thesis that I've written out. If I could just read it to you so that you would be aware of the needs that I have. And God says, I already know your need. There, there's no Harry Potter magic formula talisman to make it happen. He says, I already know your needs. So why then do we pray? The way that Jesus says this is not to say you don't need to pray. He's saying you don't need to pray with a theology that says I've got to coerce him. He already knows. So why then should we pray? One guy that I read this week, uh, this is the simple version. He says, God likes the sound of your voice. He just, he just wants to connect with you. But here's four other reasons very quickly today. Number one, we pray, even though he knows our, our needs, to express and build my faith in him. To express and build faith in him. There is something powerful about us bringing our needs to God that expresses that we know we are dependent on him. When we don't come to him, we are saying, in effect, God, I got this. When I really have something I need, I'll come to you. And what we have to understand is we got nothing <laughs> on our own. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing of eternal consequence. We fool ourselves when we sit down at a meal that we actually provided that. God provided that. We, we are foolish when we stand and look at the homes that we live in and go, look what I have done. 
And God says, you've done nothing. I was merciful. I was gracious. We look at the clothes that we wear and what we're able to provide for our children. And in a few months, we're going to be looking at Christmas and all the gifts. And there's going to be a sense of satisfaction of, look, we did it. And God says, you did nothing. We are not guaranteed our next breath apart from his mercy to us. And so when we pray, even though he already knows, sometimes we need to pray so that we know that we need it. And then the beauty of it is is that we express our need to him, and then as he meets our needs, it builds our faith and trust in him. We could go around this room and have story after story about how we had to trust God with something in 2015, per se, which gives me the confidence now that I'm facing something new at the end of 2023. Because he was faithful there and I prayed and he answered, I know that I am dependent on him today and I pray because I need him. It builds our faith. Number two, it is how we express and build our love for him, how we express and build our love for him. It is a tired illustration, but it is so true. If you are married and you never spend time or talk with your spouse, you won't be married for long. And yet somehow we feel like we can be on a perpetual business trip with God and never touch base and check in, except for God bless this travel plan. Amen. Our love for him grows when we pray to him. Understand, there is a spiritual thing that is happening in prayer where our hearts are connecting through the power of the Holy Spirit to the throne, through the throne room of the Father because of the work of Jesus Christ and the blood that was spilt to tear the veil that we can go straight into the Holy of Holies in prayer and Christ is our mediator saying, here is the prayer, you're in the presence, the Holy Spirit is there to the Father for his glory. Every time we pray and so many of us, myself included, walk up to prayer and go, thank you for this food, Amen. And it's like I barely even touched into the power of who God is and what prayer is meant to be. I mentioned one of the reasons for this series is to stir up a passion for prayer for those who already feel like they know how. I'm reminded of, of, a, of a kid's prayer that he was sort of tired and going to bed and he said, uh, now my soul to keep. If he hollers, let him go, any, many, miny, mo. And it was just sort of, he's got all these just sort of verses in his head, and in that moment he just combined it, and it's like, amen. And for so many of us, we are just reciting, if he hollers, let him go, any, many, miny, mo. And we are not really engaged in the spiritual power and connection where we build a love for God when he has invited us personally personally to connect our heart to his. The third thing that we can do is this, to actively participate in his redemptive work. God has chosen that we get to participate through prayer. This past month we had missions month and we had Keith from the Northwest and Resonate. We had Mark Phillips who is a heart for Niger in West Africa and then um, we had Nick Ripkin who has got this sort of Apostle Paul ministry, modern day Apostle Paul ministry to the persecuted church around the world. And every single one of them asked us to pray for God's work to be accomplished wherever they are. Meaning this, God has chosen that when we pray for his name to be known around the world, we are participating in his redemptive, eternal work. And so many of us have gotten jaded and callous to prayer that we're not actually engaging in the spiritual warfare and battle of his kingdom work. And when we pray, we get to participate. And then lastly, 
Stacy, if you'd come on up. Lastly, to receive direction for my life. See, prayer is communication, and it is not one way communication. And let me just be honest. You may be here today and you're not even sure if you believe in the Bible. You're not even sure if you believe the story about Jesus. And talking about prayer feels like hoodoo, voodoo. And now I'm saying that God can talk to you. And all I can tell you is, is that he does. All I can tell you is that I have prayed. And when I was smart enough in a prayer to actually shut up, and just listen. He gave me guidance. I, I can fill an hour of prayer of asking him for wisdom, but if I never say silent enough for him to give me wisdom, it's two-way communication. And I can't explain it other than it is a spiritual reality of the Holy Spirit. And I want to just caution you, always measure what you feel like God is saying against his word. That's how you know, was that just something I thought up or was that something that God is actually saying to me? As you measure it against his word. And maybe you talk to other believers to make sure that it has biblically sound principles, but I'm telling you God speaks. And sometimes it is not in, most of the time, for me at least, it's not even in words it is in the settling over me of a peace in a direction or a total stirring up of my soul in another direction to go, whoa, there's something I just can't even, like, God, you, I feel like you're shutting that door. But then when I turn this way, it's like, Phew. we pray even though he knows what we need. Because it reveals our dependence on him. It grows our love for him. We get to share in his eternal work. And he speaks to us as well. And so as we move forward, I pray, I'm going to ask Stacy to sing uh, a, a brief song. Just as we respond. And maybe all you need to do is just pray. But at the end of the notes, I'm challenging every one of us this week, at least one time, to find time away from anyone else and just pray. We'll talk about how, like the content and all that kind of stuff over the next few weeks, but whatever words you got, just pour your heart out to God and then listen to him this week. I'm telling you, we will be a church transformed when we are stirred up to pray with a clear motivation and a clear understanding of who God is and that he is our reward. Stacy. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. 
Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All join me on that chorus, please, as we stand together as before we go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Find that quiet place this week to meet with the Lord. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day.